Research shows that American distrust in government, scientists, and media has reached new heights, and this distrust in institutions is reflected in much of the world. Russian attempts to sabotage the 2016 presidential election in favor of Donald Trump were confirmed in a report released by the Senate Intelligence Committee in 2020. Equally impactful, subsections of media appeared to encourage a political propaganda feedback loop. This interference did not end with 2016, but bled into the 2020 presidential election, resulting in baseless claims of election fraud following Trump's loss and a riot at the U.S. Capitol. Political polarization again stretched across network television, news, and social media. In 2022, Americans are dubious of the electoral process. 64% of the American population now believes that democracy in the United States is in crisis and at risk of failing. At the same time raged the COVID-19 pandemic, which killed more than 6 million people globally and left many survivors with immeasurable effects on their long-term health. Despite staggering statistics, misinformation around the virus continues to circulate, and trust in public health institutions and officials has plummeted, prompting the World Health Organization to declare an infodemic. In his play Orestes, Euripides opines, when one with honeyed words but evil mind persuades the mob, great woes befall the state. Might we still overcome this onslaught of misinformation and preserve our trust in the very institutions that have governed us in some form or another for centuries? This is Megan Schaefer with the Oxford Comment. On today's episode, we spoke with three OUP authors on the past, present, and future of institutional distrust, with a particular focus on the contentious 2016 and 2020 U.S. presidential elections. For our first interview, my colleague Rachel Havard spoke with Brian Levack, author of Distrust of Institutions in Early Modern Britain and America. He talked with us about the striking parallels between the loss of trust in British and American institutions in the 17th and 18th centuries and the present day. Thank you for joining us on the Oxford Comment. Can you please introduce yourself to us? Yes, um, I am um, an historian. I am a professor emeritus at the University of Texas at Austin, and I have been writing for many years now about various subjects. I've written books on the witch hunt in early modern Europe, and uh, I edited the um, Oxford uh, Handbook on Early Modern Witchcraft. Uh, but this is um, something that I have been concerned with for a long time, um, originally uh, from teaching early modern Britain at the university for some almost 50 years. <laughs> and I guess there are two sources for this book on distrust of institutions. The first is that um, I have always taught um, John Locke's political philosophy when I'm teaching 17th century England. And um, one of the main uh, features of his book, really his main argument, is that government is, or at least should be, based on trust. And if that trust is violated, the people have a right to change the government and even possibly uh, the system of government. Uh, so that has been there for years, and we've had many discussions in those classes about um, we, how we feel about trust today. But the, then uh, in recent years, um, I have become uh, interested in trust and in particular distrust because of the uh, extensive and intensive um, distrust of government and of all institutions. I mean, these are public institutions, part of the state apparatus, or at least ones that operate in the public sphere. I decided to sort of merge these two interests and to write a book that's predominantly historical in that I investigate the loss of trust in early modern institutions, uh, but also in the last chapter to, to compare that loss of trust uh, in mainly the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries with the loss of trust in institutions today. Thank you. That brings us nicely into my first question. So what historically 
has led to people distrusting institutions and why has that increased in the last decade or so, do you think? Do you see any patterns of history repeating itself? Yes. Um, in the book, I identify some of the uh, main reasons for the loss of institutional uh, trust. And the first and probably the most important has been the abuse of power by governments and by other institutions, but especially by governments. And that is also related to the second of these general causes, which is uh, corruption as evidenced by scandals. And obviously you can see that those two, that, you know, corruption is uh, an abuse of power. So those two are, are very closely related. Uh, and then there's another one which I keep thinking about, and that is ideological conflict. Um, uh, in other words, in, in the past, you had uh, you know, conflict between uh, radical Whigs and um, and the government, and Puritans and the government, and then dissenters and the and the government. And, and you know, today uh, between right and left, uh, you could also argue there's um, uh, there is conflict between um, internationalists or globalists and um, uh, nationalists. Of, to, to use very broad uh, categories. And, um, and then the, the last one uh, is something I've been thinking about. I just make a brief reference to it in uh, the book, I think just in, in a footnote, but economic inequality, which feeds into the loss of trust in, in the government and to the entire uh, establishment. So I, I think that those those are the main uh, sources of this distrust, which which really peaked in the 17th and 18th centuries, both in um, in um, in Britain and in America. And and certainly, if you want to talk about the conflict in America, which I hope we will do a little bit, uh, obviously uh, you can see how. Uh, the distrust of the British government in the the colonies um, contributed to this uh, massive loss of trust in the British government and to their various agencies. So those are the main sources, I guess you would call them, of uh, uh, of distrust. And um, I think that um, there are all sorts of comparisons, some of which I develop in the last chapter of the book, between that loss of trust and uh, loss of trust today. And I think that you can see that we have had uh, a number of instances in recent years uh, regarding the um, uh, governmental abuse of, 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 of power. We certainly have had um, corruption <laughs> as indicated by multiple scandals. And of course, that is true of both um, recent years in America, especially during the Trump administration, but also, of course, much more recently with Boris Johnson's administration. So uh, those are some of the comparisons. And in, in terms of the abuse of power, there is certainly, and this is especially true of America, the Trump administration and the um, post-election developments that everybody is 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 following uh and you know the, heightened by the the january 6th uh, um, mob um and um and then uh, you know another thing when we're talking about economic inequality uh i think that more recently um in both countries but especially in the united states there has uh, been the display of obscene wealth, you know, as indicated uh, by the, you know, by the, the, all the super yachts and all of these um, uh, immense fortunes. And that has certainly contributed to a distrust of all um, uh, institutions, especially economic institutions, but also of, of governments in, to the extent that they have favored uh, the acquisition of such enormous and unprecedented wealth. Reflecting on the early modern period then, what efforts were made by experts or institutions to help gain the public's trust again, if any? Do you believe that the principles of trust and distrust have changed at all since that time? 
There have been efforts um, at various times in both in British and American history to um, to build trust or to regain trust that has been lost. And uh, the uh, I think the main tactic that has been used to do that, because certainly they have recognized the extent of the crisis that had developed, I think the main thing was to um, pass laws and institute policies that are fair, uh, transparent, applied consistently, and implemented efficiently. And I think we can see this uh, certainly with the growth of progressive taxation in America, um, with the passage of legislation that uh, established the welfare state. I think this is probably true in the late 19th and early 20th century. You can see the effects of this in both countries. And those were periods of relative trust in government. It's interesting, in, in the book, I uh, mention uh, the fact that Machiavelli, <laughs> who was certainly someone who thought that everybody was untrusted, untrustworthy, but he said that um, he was giving advice to rulers. This is in, mainly in the prince, but also you see some of it uh, in the discourses. He says, rulers could win trust of the people. Uh, if they pass laws that were applied consistently and did uh, not make exceptions for cronies and family members and privileged groups. And therefore, I, I think even there, he recognized that there was a sort of a roadmap to regaining trust. And that has uh, succeeded at various times, especially, as I said, sort of the late 19th century. Um, when uh, it, when actually taxation collection in, in in Britain was made much more efficient, um, it seemed to be much fairer than taxes that we had had before there. Um, and then in the, in the United States, especially with the passage of progressive uh, taxation, which began after the Civil War, but then uh, really in the early 20th century uh, became a feature of um, uh, United States uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, also, I should say that um, um, it's very, very hard to build uh, or regain trust in government and in institutions, uh, be, and, and much harder, let's say, than to uh, repair or rebuild trust between individuals. And of course, you know, we have to distinguish between what we call social trust or interpersonal trust and institutional trust. And with um, you, you can always try to repair distrust that might occur between members of the same community, people you know, um, uh, even within, um, within relationships, within marriages, within families. Uh, you can do that because you can, you can have a back and forth dialogue, I guess you'd call it. But with institutions, and this is really one of the main themes of my book, uh, which at one point I was going to title Distrusting Strangers, and the strangers uh, are a reference to the, um, the people in central institutions whom most people don't have any contact with. Uh, or very, very limited contact with. And therefore, it's hard to negotiate with them. It's hard to um, encourage them to change their, their, their policies. And that is, that is a persistent uh, problem today. We just don't know and we can't deal with the officials who you know, run the government, uh, or at least the federal government, or um, economic and financial institutions, you know, corporations. We can't try to get them to um, pursue policies that will uh, regain uh, that that trust. So that I guess that's where <laughs> I might be um, somewhat pessimistic <laughs> about about all of this. These people, the officials that run these governments, are. They're distant, and they don't know the people in the local communities, so they pursue policies pretty much ignorant of the effect that it's going to have in those communities and among those people, the local communities. Thank you.
So you'd say that it hasn't, that aspect of trust and distrust hasn't actually changed since the early modern period. No, it, it hasn't. You know, and, and this is why you don't really have the distrust of um, central institutions, national institutions, national governments in the Middle Ages, because there is a very little it is when you begin to have um, large national institutions. Um, and, and that includes, you know, economic institutions, you know, such as, you know, development of the Bank of England, that you begin to have this problem. And therefore, the book is about the early modern period. And for all practical purposes, in a way, I talk about the 16th century, but it really is the 17th century uh, at the time of the two English revolutions that distrust of government um, begins to become a major problem. And indeed, really is the source of, uh, of both revolutions. With the, um, with the first revolution, you have a very interesting development of distrust in persons. In other words, distrust by a relatively small group of, of members of the political nation of Charles I, but that extends to his entire administration, um, which of course is the institution that we're talking about. And that leads to uh, the English Revolution. And it, it eventually even leads to what we might call a third type of trust, you know, personal trust or social trust or, or, or trust and distrust. And then you have institutional trust and distrust. But what that, the next step is when people begin to lose faith and confidence in the entire system of government or the entire system that underlies the economy. And of course, that is what happens in the middle of the 17th century, because not only uh, is Charles I's government um, completely uh, uh, dismantled, uh, and then he himself is, um, is executed in 1649. And after that, the uh, entire system of government, the, uh, the monarchy, was destroyed. The House of Lords was destroyed. The English Church was destroyed, and then you know that lasted until the Restoration in 1660. But you can see how the the there was a progression of personal distrust extending to the administration of that uh, of the government uh, of the of the ruler in this case, and then that um, uh, leading into um, a distrust of uh, institutions which had to be changed. Then, of course, you have a restoration, and the same problem uh, develops in the late 17th century. And of course, that's when John Locke is writing, and he's talking about his distrust, uh, not only of Charles II and then James II, uh, but also of their entire administrations. And that leads to uh, the Glorious Revolution, in which uh, those uh, rulers were replaced uh, you know, by William and Mary, and then there was, uh, meanwhile, there was a continuation of this with the new regime between Whigs and established Whigs and radical Whigs. But again, it was the same development, uh, um, sort of repeated to some extent today, because we have a great deal of distrust of institutions in um, both in Britain, and it's reached, certainly has reached a peak in the last the last 10 years, maybe, or last, certainly the last two decades, and also um, in America. But what it has led to is a distrust of the entire system. So there's been this distrust, for example, of elections, the integrity of elections, and attempts to uh, reform those, uh, the, those um, uh, election procedures. Uh, distrust of, indeed, of democracy, which is certainly a main issue, in America today. I don't think we really have that distrust of democracy um, in, in the UK, but it, it, it shows you that there is, again, this progression towards institutional trust leading to a distrust of uh, institutions. And also in terms of economic uh, inequality, there's certainly the distrust of um, wealthy elites, but that has also led in some quarters to a distrust of the whole system of capitalism. So again, you can see the way in which um, this progression works. So not much has changed over time then. What has changed? I think it's much harder to restore trust in Britain and the US 
because first of all, institutions have become more numerous, more complex and remote. And I discussed this extensively um, in the book, but also because distrust has increased in a broad range of those institutions, including ones that really weren't distrusted before. For example, uh, the media, um, the military, the police, and the universities. And then finally, the swath of the population that exhibits this distrust, and of course they do so through uh, media in many ways, uh, has become so much larger because the political nation now is so much larger than it was back in the early modern period. Um, literacy has increased. Um, access to the news has increased. So you have you know, more institutions, you have more institutions that traditionally were not distrusted and then are trusted today. And then you have so many more people who are actually part of what we would call the political nation. In other words, people who are politically conscious. And that has a lot to do with the increase of literacy and the spread of the news media. Finally, conspiracy theories as shown by the actions of January the 6th and reactions to the COVID-19 vaccine, et cetera, et cetera, seem to be thriving in the internet age. Why do people love conspiracy theories so much? And has it always been the case? Well, I think that uh, there has been a significant change in recent periods and, and, and certainly um, the, the growth of the uh, internet and the, you know, the entire uh, and social media, for example, is a part of that. You had very, very limited media. You had uh, a few newspapers in the late 17th century, you had news books, um, but it was very, very hard for information to circulate um, in, the, in the early modern period. And that even is true into the 18th century, where you do get more newspapers and you get more journals. Uh, still, that was a limited, uh, there was a limited audience for those because Literacy was limited, even though it was it was relatively high. Uh, you, know, you could say that England in the 17th and 18th century was the most literate society the world had ever known, but the literacy rate was still very, very low. It was much easier to discredit such theories in the pre-internet uh, era, where um, you didn't have that type of media coverage. You didn't have the echo chambers, if you wish to call them that, of Fox News. And you didn't have the um, the recruitment, the liberal recruitment of people to subscribe to the big lie. And I think one of the problems with this, and this is unprecedented, is that Trump and many of his supporters have refused to accept the factual refutation of those theories. And in the past, they have been factually refuted. And I think that that is a direct result of what we call the war on truth, especially uh, scientific truth regarding, let's say, the pandemic. And this is enormously important because if you say, well, there's no evidence for your big lie, and they say, well, it just doesn't matter because um, we reject facts. So I think that um, I think that helps to explain. We have entered a different, new, unprecedented period in the development and the subscription to uh, conspiracy theories. Definitely. Well, thank you for joining us and talking about distrusted institutions and a bit about your book as well. We've really enjoyed it. No, well, thank you. I've enjoyed talking with you. Our second guest was Robert Ferris, co-author of Network Propaganda, Manipulation, Disinformation and Radicalization in American Politics, who shared his research into the 2016 US presidential election and the influence of the right-wing media ecosystem. Robert, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, I'd be delighted to. Uh, Robert Farris, I'm a senior researcher at the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard University. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your book focuses on the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Why? We had 
built a media analysis platform to study broad scale media dynamics. And the platform just happened to be developed sufficiently to take on a huge topic, uh, such as the 2016 election. Uh, we had no idea how interesting it would be when we started the tape running. Jeb Bush looked like the most likely candidate to win the Republican nomination. Um, it turns out that the discourse was a lot more interesting than we had anticipated and that disinformation as a topic really came to a head during the 2016 election, as we all know. Um, but we were fortunate enough to have a near comprehensive database of media coverage of the 2016 election to be able to study that both at a broad scale and at a granular scale to really dig into how the discourse evolved over the 18 month period. How has disinformation contributed to political polarization in the United States? I think we need to look at disinformation as both a cause and a consequence um, as it co-evolves with a lot of other related trends that are intertwined. Um, Disinformation, I think, moves along with distrust in media, along with epistemic separation, with institutional separation, with affective polarization, the rising prominence of, of partisan media. So I, I think we need to think of it as both pushing on the greater separation of, of kind of warring parties within the United States and also as a function of the structures that have evolved over time. Um, let, let me say a little bit more about that. So we, we've seen a pretty profound drop in trust in media over several decades, looking at surveys. And I think to understand that it's not a distrust across the board, I think it's tied into polarization and that people are increasingly distrustful of media in a separate epistemic system. So the, the United States over several decades has divided itself into two different epistemic systems, two different media systems. And I think the distrust is across, not within those different, um, those different spheres. Um, I, I refer to the process as epistemic separation in that people have come to put their trust in different media sources. And though there's very little overlap in now in these media ecosystems, there's really few to no media sources that serve as authoritative voices, as trusted sources of information for everyone across the political spectrum. And again, I think this is both cause and consequence of other trends over time, but we need to understand that to really understand disinformation as well. So disinformation is a consequence of that in that there is a largely separate media ecosystem for conservative media in the United States that focuses more on loyalty to party than it does to getting the facts right. They've largely abandoned the standards and practices of traditional media that evolved over much of the 20th century. And that has allowed misinformation to take root there. If your primary objective is producing media that is favorable to your side, then you're more open to um, being letting the accuracy and truth slip a little bit in the process. And so I think that in that sense, disinformation has been enabled by these long term structural changes in media in the United States. Disinformation certainly does also contribute to polarization. So it's it's a uh, it's a it's a circle. It's a, a self reinforcing circle that we're we're seeing. I think the prime example of that would be the the media re response to the 2020 election. So the fact that so many in America believe the false narrative that the 2020 
United States presidential election was stolen by Biden and, and the Democrats is almost certainly exacerbating um, polarization in the United States. And understandably so. If you truly believe that the election was stolen, you're going to take offense to that. And, and that's where we stand today is that these multiple dynamics feed off of one another and have changed over time. In what ways did disinformation seize on the media's structural weaknesses? Yeah, so um, disinformation is able to take root where the media structures are not policing against it. And, and that happens in partisan media, um, where again, where your, your loyalty to um, congenial narratives, if that Trump's getting it right, then disinformation is gonna take hold. Um, what we've seen in the United States is that conservative media has forged its own path uh, it started many decades ago. This predates the internet. It's not an internet phenomenon. We see it starting in the 1990s, well, actually taking off in the 1990s with the launching of Fox News. But it was already well ingrained in, in the US media and political systems in the 1980s when Rush Limbaugh launched his very successful um, radio show. Conservatives have been making the case that they were not being treated fairly by traditional media for many, many decades before that. So they charted their own course and they created a separate media system that has created distance between traditional media and in doing so has left itself open to disinformation. And what we've seen in the process is that partisan media develop standards and practices that are fundamentally different than traditional media. And it is these what we call epistemic practices, how people determine who's an authoritative voice, what narratives are allowed to take root. It's those norms and standards that are really at the core of disinformation in the United States. It's in essence, the operating system of partisan media um, allows disinformation to take hold. Whereas in traditional media, they're actively opposing disinformation and fighting against false reporting and false narratives. This is not the case in partisan media. And as such, I see this as a structural issue I think a lot of people try to explain it in terms of the sophistication or education or the personalities of the individuals involved. I don't think you need to go there to explain what we see here. These are networked systems that over time create their own standards and practices for how media is conducted. And if you create a partisan media ecosystem, you're going to get disinformation as part and parcel of the product that is produced. How does your work help us to understand the current political climate in the US? So we're seeing in the current political climate in the US, the same basic structures and practices that we documented during the 2016 election. The ways in which these media ecosystems operate, the manner in which people elevate voices, the manner in which narratives are negotiated and, and produced it at a network scale, at a broad scale, these are all the same processes that we observed in 2016 and 2017. So we're not surprised to see the level of discourse and the level of disinformation that's taken root and is really fundamentally informing um, media in the United States today. I think also what that means is it's very difficult to think about how to combat it. Perhaps we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But what we see in the structures of media today are very separate media ecosystems with different sources of authority, 
different ways of deciding what is news and what is not news and what should be amplified and what should not be amplified. And that is deeply ingrained in the social and the culture and the political fabric of the United States at this point. It's been in the making for many, many decades, and uh, it is firmly entrenched. And to see a large proportion of the United States being misinformed and disinformed is in no means surprising. The only question really is who is going to seize the reins of this of this disinformation and propaganda machine next. How can we best navigate away from the epistemic crisis facing politics and media? Ideally, reform would be coming from within, that the areas within the media system where disinformation is running rampant, that you would find reformers there that would be fighting back. Uh, unfortunately, that does not look likely. Uh, many have tried, and what you get for trying to do that is is essentially being put into exile. So we see in, in American politics now that people who oppose Donald Trump and oppose the um, stolen election narrative are sidelined primarily, and that there is essentially a, a dogma within mainstream of conservative media is that you don't go against that. You don't try to correct the record. So taking that on is a, is a very big challenge. Um, one can imagine strategies aimed at containment to ensure that the purveyors of disinformation are not able to set the larger media agenda. That is what we saw in the 2016 election, by the way, is that people were able through the email narrative and the narratives of, of corruption and the, and the leaks and the investigations over Hillary Clinton's emails were able to set the agenda for the election campaign. It was fairly clear in public opinion that when people were asked what they thought of Hillary Clinton, it was all about the emails. And that was a very successful agenda setting campaign by political operatives and conservative media. And traditional media, while using the same standards and certainly being well-intentioned, um, ended up feeding that narrative and amplifying that narrative, and it became the narrative of the election. I think that folks have learned from that, and when the same playbook was rolled out in 2020 to try to make the election about Hunter Biden, traditional media did not go for the bait in this and uh, and decided to um, not cover that story to the same degree that they covered the, uh, the emails related to Hillary Clinton. So one strategy is not allow media manipulators to set the larger agenda that is very, very important. There are things you could do to fight the most egregious forms of disinformation. I think the defamation cases that we've seen recently against Alex Jones and against Fox News and OAN for the uh, the lies related to the election. These defamation cases are, I think, important in combating the most egregious forms of disinformation, but they are only going to take out the worst forms. And I think we should be very wary about trying to use government regulation to rein in disinformation. That would be, I think, very problematic to do that. It's just very, very difficult to draw a good line between legitimate public discourse, propaganda, and disinformation in a way that you would want to take that on from a regulatory way. I think there's many ways in which you could, in which we should collectively invest more in responsible media organizations. I think particularly at the local level, there's um, a lot of areas where people are underserved and do not have access to 
media that are professional and responsible and following the standards of, of professional media and that we ought to be finding ways to fund more local media. I think that would be very, very helpful. There's a there's a trend in American politics for the nationalization of media and politics. And I think anything we can do to fight that trend would be very, very helpful as well. And more local news, better funded local news would help with that perhaps. Um, in the end, I think we need to be patient and persistent and keep doing the things we're doing right now. And hopefully we can turn this ship around. Um, it's taken many, many decades to get into this conundrum. And I think it's going to take a very long time to get back out as well. Thank you so much, Robert, for joining us and for sharing your insight into disinformation today. Thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure. Lastly, we spoke with Tom Nichols, author of The Death of Expertise and Our Own Worst Enemy. We discussed the power of conspiracy theories, the distrust of institutions in recent history, and where we go from here. We're here today with Tom Nichols. Good to be with you, and um, thanks for having me. I'm um, really pleased that uh, The Death of Expertise and Our Own Worst Enemy are both Oxford books, uh, both of them about democracy and knowledge and uh, protecting our democratic future. Uh, so um, thanks very much for inviting me to be here. What historically has led to people distrusting institutions and why has that increased in the last decade or so? Well, people historically distrust institutions because that's the nature of um, a democratic society, that institutions are small and they're exclusionary and they're elitist uh, by virtue of you know, needing to know things to be part of them. And so that's an old story. The new story is that people distrust institutions because they have now come to believe that they actually know better on all of the issues that institutions handle. Uh, and I think the underlying problem there is narcissism, that um, people really do believe that they are as smart as economists or doctors or climate scientists or anybody else um, because they have so much information available to them. And that's the thing that's really historically a new phenomenon. Do you see the public learning to trust institutions in the future? Do events like that of January 6th signify that this distrust will increase in the future? I think that's the wrong question. Events no longer matter. Education no longer matters uh, because trust in institutions is now an extension of uh, partisan identity. And so the people who trust institutions will continue to do so. The people who don't will continue to distrust those institutions. You, you have very highly educated people who distrust expertise and in institutions simply because it is in their partisan catechism to do so. On the other hand, you have people who don't have very much education, don't have a whole lot of experience with government, who trust institutions because they see those institutions as being on their side. So I don't think it's gonna be a matter of events driving trust in institutions but rather um, the question of, are we going to remain as partisan and divided as we are? Because that I think really drives the problem of distrust in institutions. What do you think experts or institutions can do to help gain the public's trust again? Well, I, <laughs> I'm actually kind of old school about this. I think that experts and institutions uh, should stop trying to coddle and uh, reassure the public and simply say uh, that they are experts. This is their opinion. Um, like it or don't like it, take it or leave it. Um, we don't really ask the people who build jetliners to have an engaged dialogue with people who think the earth is flat because we don't build aircraft that way. I think the same goes for everything from politics to uh, COVID policy to simply say, um, rather than have long 
you know, pointless, fruitless discussions with people who just want to argue for hours on end. I think this, I think experts really need to kind of take the role of the serious adult in the room and say, I'm not going to argue about whether the earth is flat. I'm not going to argue about whether COVID vaccines work. Um, you know, I'm going to say, this is my opinion. These are the risks and the costs and the benefits of various courses of action. And you as a democratic people can now choose among them. I think one terrible mistake that experts made, particularly in the COVID pandemic, was to try to manage the public's expectations. And in part, they did this because the Trump administration, um, I think, had just kind of checked out um, on COVID as a political problem rather than a health problem. But I still think that was a mistake on the part of public health experts. Um, experts need to, to just engage the public, tell them what the costs and benefits of various courses of action are, and then step back and say, you know, the public has the right to be wrong, uh, even when they choose something that the experts might not like. Why do people love conspiracy theories so much? People love conspiracy theories because it makes life interesting. It's simply not interesting enough to say that 19 guys with box cutters got on some jetliners and hijacked them. That's too easy, it's too random, it's too terrifying. Uh, it's much more interesting to say that, you know, people in the government knew and there were, um, you know, that there was coordination and that the bad guys and the good guys are all the same guys. Um, conspiracy theories are a way of imposing a very complicated order on what seems to me a random and chaotic world, but it's also a way for a bored and affluent society to add meaning to its to, to people's lives. Um, that way, when you know, if you're a believer in conspiracy theories, there are no accidents. Life is not simply one boring string of events after another. Everything is part of a grand tapestry. Um, and you are part of a great adventure of unlocking all of those secrets. Um, and I think that um, the two times that you see conspiracy theories arise in societies is after a terrible trauma, after World War I, after uh, the Kennedy assassination and so on. But the other is when you have a very high level of affluence and very high levels of social boredom, which I think is what we're living through now. And so conspiracy theories are attractive because they give meaning and a kind of frisson of um, excitement to people who otherwise think that their lives are very dull and very meaningless. How do we start being part of the problem and start being part of the solution? I think the most important thing that we can do on the individual level is to turn to people we know as much as we might love them or care for them or you know, that they're members of our families or our close friends, and simply to say, um, no, your view that, you know, um, Venezuelan voting machines uh, were controlled by the Italian space program is simply wrong. And I'm not going to discuss it. Um, that at some point you make it clear to people that you are not going to reward this kind of attention seeking behavior by constantly indulging in it. But I think it's important to turn to the people we love, the people we care about and say, this is wrong. Um, I'm not gonna argue with you about why it's wrong. In your heart, you know it's wrong. And um, we're not gonna have this discussion. And it's time for you to start acting like a responsible uh, citizen. Now that will turn some people off, but in my experience, it also uh, is sometimes like a bucket of cold water where people suddenly pull up short and say, you know, if this person that I respect or care about has told me this and that, you know, they're not going to argue with me all evening about this, um, maybe I should, I should rethink what I'm doing. But that has to happen on an individual level and the choice to do it has to rest with each one of us. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insight on these issues. Thank you for having me. We want to thank our guests, Brian Levack, Robert Ferris, and Tom Nichols for speaking with us about disinformation and distrust in institutions, both past and present.
Please check out our show notes on the OUP blog for a recommended reading list exploring just a few of the ideas discussed today. New episodes of the Oxford Comment will premiere on the last Tuesday of each month. Be sure to follow Oxford Academic on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and YouTube to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. While you're at it, please do subscribe to the Oxford Comment wherever you regularly listen to podcasts including Apple, Google, and Spotify. Lastly, we want to thank the crew of the Oxford Comment for their assistance on today's episode. Episode 76 was produced by Stephen Filippi, Rachel Havard, and me, Megan Schaefer. Thank you for listening.